Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Fleece once again with the last video on the introduction to A and P and we're going to focus here on body cavities. So what are body cavities? In short, there are these chambers that are um, delineated with these membranes that ensure that we create these compartments in the body in which our organs, sometimes groups of organs, uh, can be located and kept in place. Our organs in our body are actually very nicely organized. They're not just all thrown in there. They're actually organized into these regions that we refer to as body cavities. Now, it's probably not the best thing to think now that there are all these holes in our body. No, think of these as chambers in your body and they're delineated by walls of membranes. And we'll get to those membranes in just a moment. They're called serous membranes, but we'll look at those in more detail in just a moment. It's, it's advantageous for our organs to be located in these body cavities or in these regions so that they don't shift around. It wouldn't be a good thing when you start to jump up and down playing basketball uh, if your heart suddenly ends up, you know, way down in your, in your pubic area, let's say, that wouldn't make any sense. We want our organs to stay where they function most optimally. So there are, um, that's one advantage. The other advantage of having these serous membranes to where we have distinct body cavities is to make it harder for pathogens. A pathogen is a disease-creating organism for pathogens to cross um, from organ to organ. If we have some boundaries that, um, of membranes, it's going to be tough for pathogens to spread throughout the body and become systemic. That's not to say that pathogens cannot do it, but it's going to be much more challenging. And finally, we're going to see in just a moment that these serous membranes uh, also prevent friction of the organs um, because all of our organs move. Your heart beats, your lungs expand and recoil, but all or many of your digestive structures are constantly, as they're going through digestion, they're constantly having walls that are contracting and relaxing. It's not just the stomach doing that. Think of the bladder, think of the uterus, lots of structures that are moving around in the body. So what are these body cavities called? Well, let's first start with this lateral view. And if we take a look at the lateral view, we see two major body cavities. Um, illustrated on the dorsal side, we see in the orange, the dorsal body cavity. The dorsal body cavity has within it two smaller body cavities. So notice that we are dealing with hierarchical levels. So the dorsal body cavity has two smaller body cavities inside the cranial cavity, which in its turn holds the brain, the vertebral cavity, which we sometimes call the spinal cavity, which holds, of course, the spinal cord. This whole anterior side that is multicolored is the ventral body cavity, and we see it better labeled here. The ventral body cavity, so let's switch over to the anterior view now. The ventral body cavity has um, several smaller body cavities, but we actually we should say the ventral body cavity has, first of all, two smaller body cavities, and they in turn have even smaller body cavities. So you can see the different hierarchical levels that we're going through. Be sure you spell them out for yourself, practice with them. Those are the kinds of questions that you will be tested on. So the ventral body cavity is going to be consisting of this one that sits superior to the diaphragm. This is your breathing muscle, the diaphragm. Um, notice it's spelling, by the way. Make sure that you know how to spell diaphragm. So the whole body cavity that sits superior to the diaphragm, we call the thoracic body cavity, the thoracic body cavity. Inferior, we see the abdominopelvic cavity. The abdominopelvic cavity sits here. Let's focus on the thoracic 
cavity in the purple uh, on the on this view and in this view it consists of purple as well as um, turquoise. Notice that the thoracic cavity consists of three smaller cavities. Two of those smaller cavities hold the lungs and we call them the pleural cavities. So we have a right and a left pleural cavity. Medial to these two pleural cavities, we have the cavity that holds the heart, and we call that the pericardial cavity, which literally means around. Peri means around. Think of perimeter. Cardia, heart. Now, superior and medial, superior to the pericardial cavity and the heart, with the heart in it, and superior and medial at the same time to the pleural cavities, we have this orange region, which is not a body cavity. It's a region that holds the esophagus and some of the major blood vessels, and we call it um, the superior mediastinum. So this is not a body cavity, the mediastinum. So not a body cavity, BC for body cavity. So that's the thoracic body cavity. Let's take a look now at the abdominal pelvic body cavity. The abdominal pelvic cavity has the smaller red cavity and the smaller green cavity. And as the name abdominal pelvic cavity says, the bigger red one is the abdominal cavity. Most of your digestive structures are located in here. The pelvic cavity holds most of the internal reproductive structures such as in the female the ovaries for instance and the uterus um, in the male it would be uh, the tubes that guide the sperm for instance clearly not the penis along with the testicles they are located outside of the body it's very important you guys when you're asked to list examples of structures that make up the pelvic cavity that you don't keep it general and say, oh, the reproductive organs, because that's not correct. Many of our reproductive structures, both in males and females, are outside of the body. Uh, and again, certainly the penis, the scrotum, all structures that are located outside of the body. We also find inside of the pelvic cavity, the bladder, for instance, and there are other structures, but those are some of the important ones. So all of these smaller body cavities, ex except for the mediastinum there, um, are going to form the ventral body cavity. Again, be sure you can list them in order to form your hier hierarchy with its hierarchical levels. Now these body cavities are formed with walls made up by serous membranes or we can call them serosi. Singular, it would be serosa, just with the A at the end. So one serosa, two or more serosi. Let's take a look at what they look like. And this is a typical picture you will see in any AMP book. So on the left side here, we have the heart with its serosi surrounding it. But to better understand this, Let's take a look at this image. So imagine that you had a balloon. It's kind of deflated, not totally, but enough to where you can punch your fist into it and allow for the balloon to hug your fist. Your fist represents an organ. We're going to look at the heart, but this could be the lungs or digestive structures, bladder, it doesn't matter. And notice now how the balloon hugs the wrist. So it's going to have, the, or the wrist is going to have some of the balloon, balloon material touching it, and that is one membrane. Then we're going to have a little bit of space with, filled with air in the case of the balloon, and then we're going to have this external balloon material, which does not touch the organ, or in this case, the fist. So consequently, we have two layers of membranes. They're continuous, but since they're located in different locations, we give them different names. Welcome to anatomy. 
very often one and the same structure gets a different name when it's located in different areas. Your aorta, which is the biggest blood vessel, the biggest artery that leaves your heart, gets unique names depending on where it is in the body. So keep that in mind, just as an example. Okay, so let's now apply what we learned here to the heart. And so the layer of the serosa that touches the heart, we call the visceral layer. Don't worry about pericardium yet, the visceral layer. Viscera referring to the organ, the organs in our body, particularly many of our organs in the abdominal pelvic cavity and the thoracic cavity, we refer to as the viscera. The organs such as the brain and spinal cord in the vertebral column, I'm not, I'm sorry, in the uh, and uh, what am I saying here, in the dorsal body cavity, we don't re easily refer to as viscera, but all of the other structures we refer to as viscera. So the membrane that, the part of the membrane that touches the viscera, we will call the visceral serous layer. Then we're going to have a little bit of space that is filled with fluid. Now this space is minimal, so minimal that there's just enough watery fluid here, which we call serous fluid, um, and then we get to the next layer. So these, which we call the parietal layer. This is the layer that will abut, for instance, in this case, um, inferiorly, this would touch the diaphragm somewhat. Um, it could touch some of the, 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 rib, the ribs um, more anteriorly, etc. And it's starting to press up against uh, the lungs on the lateral aspects of the heart as well, obviously. Again, the serous fluid is so minimal that these two layers are really almost touching one another, but they don't get stuck to one another because they have that watery fluid in there. So these two layers can nicely slide along one another which is important when the heart is beating, contracting, relaxing, we wouldn't want that friction to occur. So that fluid helps with that. Once again, really, this is one and the same membrane. It's just that its anatomy is such that it's folded up to where we have two distinct locations of the membrane. Now, depending on which organ or location we are in, in the body, we will give these cirrhosi more unique names. So in the case of the heart, which is located in the pericardial cavity, we refer to the two cirrhosi as the visceral pericardium and the parietal pericardium. And notice that the cavity is really that space in between the two cirrhosi. Now, the lungs, have a similar arrangement of their serosi, and we refer to their serosi as the pleura, the parietal and the visceral pleura. In the digestive, I'm sorry, in the um, abdominal pelvic area, on the other hand, we talk about the parietal and visceral peritoneum, kind of an, an, an interesting name. And when you get to AMP2, you will get a better understanding for why we're using the term peritoneum. Essentially, all of your digestive, many of your digestive structures, stomach, liver, um, all the way down to the structures in the pelvic area are going to be characterized by the presence of the parietal and the visceral peritoneum. Now that you have a better understanding of the location of the abdominal pelvic cavity, let's take a look at how medicine likes to divide up this rather large cavity into smaller parts or smaller regions. And we'll get started with the right figure, this one here, which divides or which shows how the abdominal pelvic cavity can be divided up into four easy quadrants by literally drawing a cross that starts from the sternum all the way down to the pubic symphysis and then near the bottom of the ribs on either side 
uh, we'll use that as our horizontal line of the cross. And so this creates four quadrants, easily named right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant, and right lower quadrant. And notice the abbreviations, which are very typical. This is a pretty simple way of dividing up this, the abdo abdominal pelvic cavity. And for instance, notice that the liver or a good portion of the liver is located in the right upper quadrant and then a smaller po portion in the left upper quadrant. The left upper quadrant would also hold the spleen, for instance, which is tucked away underneath the ribs right about here. The more detailed system to divide up the ab abdominal pelvic cavity is illustrated here on your left. And so this time we have nine smaller regions. And notice that their names are listed in each one of the squares here. And how I have also added a nice uh, explanation for the uh, Latin and Greek roots. Um, by now, you guys know that hypo means lower, hyper means more. Chondro, you know, is cartilage. Actually, you don't know that yet, but you will as you study the tissues. Anything gastro, as in uh, gastroenterologist, is a person who, or an MD, that specializes in the stomach. Gastroenterologist referring to the stomach. Ilium, spelled with an I here, is the flank or the groin. And something that has the term lumbar in it is anything near the loin. So let's start with some of the easier regions that uh, probably already make sense to you. Where you have your iliac bones, there you can have or you can specify these two regions as your uh, right and left iliac regions. And then where your belly button is, that would be the umbilical region. Now notice that superior to the umbilical region and inferior to it, we have two gastric regions. The region that sits right on top of the stomach, we call the epigastric region, which is what epi refers to on top of. Hypo meaning below the stomach. And then where we have a lot of cartilage in the ribs, that's where we talk about the hypochondriac region. So this literally means below the, the cartilage of the ribs. And then finally, we have the less obvious names of right and left lumbar regions. We tend to think of these regions as sitting on the back. And indeed, we have um, the lumbar region of our spine or vertebral column, which is the lower back region where many, many of us have pain. Um, but we also use these terms lumbar for these two abdominal pelvic regions lateral to the umbilical region. So this wraps up all of chap the chapter that introduces you to anatomy and physiology. Till next time.